It is the second week of our guest sessions, and we're really lucky to have Erin Murray here from the Marine Stewardship Council. So um, we started last week with Brenda Books, looking at the history and evolution of the organic certification in Washington and beyond. I think we probably could have had Brenda here for another couple sessions, just because she has so much history and knowledge around um, the initiation of that program and also um, what it's currently doing. Um, but please, if you do have other questions or you want to follow up or if you're interested in the job opportunities that um, Brenda shared, definitely um, reach out to her and that program. I know she is quite busy, so if you don't hear directly from her, um, contacting someone affiliated with the program um, may also get you a response as well. Um, and in the meantime, we're, we're moving forward with uh, looking at different certifications in the food system and how they address a myriad of complex um, social and environmental issues, economic issues as well. And so we're moving from the land with organics to the sea where we're going to look at how certifications have been applied to fisheries and also aquaculture. And we're really lucky to have, again, Erin Murray here who's a UW alum. I actually didn't know that when Erin and I were put in touch. So um, she'll be here to talk more with you about this subject, and um, we'll have time for Q&A um, after Erin's session. So let's welcome Erin to the seminar. Yay. All right. Can you guys hear me? This is so high tech now that everything is plugged in with recording. Um, anyways, hello, my name is Erin Murray. I work for the Marine Stewardship Council. And thank you so much for having me here today to talk you know, about certification programs and how we can use them to support sustainable seafood and food security. So a little bit about me. Um, yeah, uh, I am a UW alum. I graduated from the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs back in 2017. So my um, grad research actually looked at eelgrass habitat. And prior to that, I went to Western Washington University. So I've gone to school in the state my entire life. Um, my undergrad degree is in environmental policy. So I paired that with um, kind of an interdisciplinary degree, degree with UW, um, the SMEA school. Um, so when I graduated about six years ago, I jumped actually into salmon recovery. So I worked for the state of Washington um, doing a lot of salmon recovery projects since that is a key theme in the state of Washington. If you didn't know when we talk about environmental stuff, Sam, salmon is really the keystone species here. Um, and what I found when I was working at the state was that it was really difficult to translate um, in the environmental field work on species conservation, um, to day-to-day -day choices in life, right? So I was working on big restoration projects um, or working on bridges or culverts to um, allow salmon to bypass into um, freshwater areas. And I had a hard time talking about that with my family at the dinner table. It just didn't seem relevant about how, you know, this big fish project, you know, impacted someone's day-to-day -day life. And so when I left the state, um, actually working for the Marine Stewardship Council seemed like um, a really good fit for me because I liked the idea of working with a program that really was focusing on ocean conservation, but doing it in a way that it's really applicable to everyone's lives. So, you know, everyone has to eat, everyone has to go to the grocery store, at least in this country. We, you know, make choices daily about the things that we consume. And um, a certification program gives you an opportunity to choose or shop your values based on that. So um, in the time we have together today, I'm just going to go over, this is a, what we'll talk about today. I'll go over seafood as a global resource for, as a primer. For the, some of you might know a little bit about food, seafood and its role in food security, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll then do a deep dive into the Marine Stewardship Council and kind of our uh, certification framework and how we use that to really instigate behavior change. Um, and change on the water. Uh, I'll dive a little bit into our fishery standard, which is really my world, so it's going to be really technical, so bear with me as we get through that section, but then we'll zoom out and look at a case study that's a little closer to home here on the west coast of the U.S., um, and if we have time, I'll finish on some consumer insights that we have from a recent survey that we just did with our org, and then time for questions. 
So seafood is a global resource. Over three billion people rely on seafood as their um, primary source of protein in their diet. Um, and 12% of the entire world's population relies on seafood as their livelihoods. They um, either work in this industry or are related somehow to the seafood industry. Um, we're seeing with additional pressures with climate change, a 40% reduction in our ocean's productivity for fisheries, especially in tropical climates. So that's a big concern looking into the future about the productivity of our oceans. And then finally, seafood, seafood is one of the most traded food commodities in the entire wor world. So it sounds like you touched a little bit about land-based organics in your last session, um, but seafood really outpaces a lot of other commodities in that how much it's traded. So an example of that of, is 40% of all products are exported. So that's 10 times more than, let's say, coffee being um, traded around the world. Um, also, when you think about your average meal, your average meal travels about 1,500 miles to get to your plate. But for seafood, seafood travels about 5,000 miles from where it's produced to where it's consumed. And it's not just about fish fillet, so it's not about what you're having for dinner that night. Seafood is also in a variety of different products. So think beauty products or nutritional supplements. Um, or additives, so it's not just, um, we're looking across many different um, forms in which it ends up with the consumer. Uh, the other thing to really highlight about this commodity is that because it travels so far to get to the consumer, many different players are involved in handling that, from where, it's, where fish might be caught to where it's processed or packaged and then finally delivered to a consumer. There's many different people who are involved in this supply chain. So to kind of set the scene around challenges when we think about um, fisheries productivity or our oceans is that um, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, estimates that 34% of our fisheries are overfished, meaning that they are caught um, beyond an extent where the fisheries stock can recover. They can't reproduce to keep up with the demand of how it's being fished. Three in 10 of products are mislabeled and upwards of 30% of fish that is caught are caught illegally. Um, so thinking about all of these challenges, one of the big questions we have is, you know, how do we feed the world? When um, the United Nations estimates that we'll have 10 billion people on this planet by 2050, um, seafood can play a really vital role in actually feeding that um, population growth. Um, it's highly nutritious, um, has low uh, impact on, on carbon footprint, and um, will, it has the ability to potentially, if managed correctly, um, be expanded into use to, to feed that population. Um, what I have on screen here are the figures of, from the FAO of the countries in which that they rely on seafood as over 20% of their Day, uh, intake are all those orange dots. And the figure on the right-hand side is um, the state of our stocks. So you can see overfish um, stocks are increasing, but we do have 64% of stocks that are able to sustain fishing pressure. Um, we also are seeing in research that uh, responsibly managed fisheries can um, can be uh, one of, like, if they're managed well, they can be relied on into the future for seafood consumption. Okay, so now I've set the scene, kind of the problem statement of when we think about seafood and um, food security from our oceans. Um, how does the Marine Stewardship Council come to play in this? So, you know, the Marine Stewardship Council, we're an independent international nonprofit. We've been in the business for 25 years, and uh, our vision is really oceans teeming with life and ensuring that we have sustainable seafood for generations to come. And the way that we do that is through our mission. So we are able to recognize and reward where sustainable fishing is happening. And we, um, through our eco-label, we hope to influence the choice that people make when buying seafood. 
And um, we're, we work with our partners to try to encourage best practices and um, transforming the seafood market to become more sustainable. So the Marine Stewardship Council is a science-based organization. I will highlight that and we'll get into some of the nitty gritty science later. But um, the one thing that, that we have two mechanisms in how we support sustainable fishing from boat to plate. And that is our fishery standard and our chain of custody standard. And those two standards play together throughout the supply chain from where the fish gets caught and ends up on a consumer's plate. So how the program works, the Marine Stewardship Council is entirely voluntary. So fisheries or clients or whoever wants to be assessed by the fishery standard, that is their choice. And um, they can do that by approaching a third party assessor or think of it like a third party consultant to be assessed against our standard. Um, and then fish that are certif or successfully certified throughout the supply chain are eligible to be used by the, um, use the blue fish tick eco label, which is that in the right hand corner. And that's an indicator to a consumer to build trust um, that what they are buying is what they said they're buying and they can um, have faith that that was caught from a sustainable source and, and accountable throughout the supply chain. So these are our two standards. And the way that I like to think about standards are think of them as grading rubrics. So the Marine Stewardship Council looks across the board at best management practices, best science, and we develop these rubrics on how a fishery should be graded against that. Whether they have best management, uh, harvest control rules in place, they're looking at um, this, the, the stock and um, if they can replicate and, and be stable into the future. Um, and the three pillars of our fishery standard are, first we look at, is the stock healthy? Second, we look at, what are the ecosystem impacts? So the act of fishing on this stock, what are their impacts to habitat? Are they affecting habitat? Are they degrading habitat? Also, are they impacting other species that they don't intend to catch? Are they impacting marine mammals? Are they impacting whales, endangered and threatened protected species? What, are, what is this fishery's impact on the ecosystem? And then third, we look at effective management. Is there effective management in place to halt the fishery if things become um, too dire? Or that there's good feedbacks in, in data collection that, so that the, fish, or the fishery can be monitored. monitored. And then in our chain of custody standards, so that is um, ocean to plate traceability through the supply chain. So after the boat hits the dock and when it gets handed off to either processors or is packaged, um, the things we look for are identification of that fish throughout the supply chain, that it's segregated from other fish that might be not certified, um, that there is effective management in the supply chain, and that at the end of the day, only certified product gets the logo on it. So when you think about certifications, as you are probably learning in this seminar, um, MSC is also certified against other certifications for best practice. So um, these are all the uh, programs that we meet global best practice requirements for our own certification program. So we meet the, the FAO um, Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries and Eco-Labeling Guidelines. MSC also meets the International Social and Environmental Accreditation for Labeling Alliance. It's a really long name, but it's ICEAL is the short term for that. Um, we meet their codes of best practice. And we also meet uh, the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative Benchmark for Seafood Schemes, that's GSSI. So we too look to our peers to be assessed to make sure that our program is um, reliable. So um, I wanna take some time on this slide just because when you think about um, many different nonprofits operating in the space of ocean conservation, the Marine Stewardship Council takes a really unique approach. So we take a market-based approach. So some nonprofits might say, don't eat fish. Don't eat fish, just avoid it, and then that's how we'll save the oceans. 
the Marine Stewardship Council really believes that that's not a really realistic statement. Like maybe that is an option for some cultures around the world, but not every um, nation or different communities can make that choice. And so we use a market-based approach in order to drive change, to m encourage fisheries to operate more sustainably. So this is how our theory works. So first, we have a, uh, a, sustainable, a fish stock that becomes certified against our standard. That's number one. By having a, a fishery certified, it then allows a um, retailer or restaurant to source from that sustainable fishery. Once that retail and re rest or restaurants can source from something that's, con that's deemed sustainable, there's traceability throughout the supply chain with the eco-label. That eco-label then allows consumers to shop their values. So a consumer can decide that ocean sustainability is important to them. They don't want to support overfished stocks. They don't want to support illegally caught fish. Um, and so they can choose to purchase fish with that assurance and that label on it. And that in turn drives demand. And so as um, demand increases for certified or sustainable seafood, we then have more fishermen on the water saying, I want to be part of that program. I also want to be sustainable. So it drives change and it's a feedback loop. So when you're at the grocery store or at a restaurant and you see the blue tick fish eco label, what that label is um, telling a consumer is one, that the fish is sustainably sourced, the stocks are fished in a way that does not threaten the population's long-term health and minimizes impact to the surrounding wildlife and ecosystem. It also tells the consumer that that fish is verified so the chain of custody assures that throughout the supply chain, this came from an MSC certified sustainable source. And then finally, that this fish is wild caught because the Marine Stewardship Council only focuses on wild caught fisheries. We do have a sister organization, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, ASC, that focuses on aquaculture, but because the topics are so largely different between wild caught fisheries and aquaculture fisheries, our organizations do not focus on, we split those two topics between ourselves. So MSC's impact. So we've been around for 25 years. We have about 250 staff around the world. Our headquarters is in London, um, but we have pretty good global coverage. So over 539 fisheries are in our program around the world. Um, and we have over 59 countries that are dedicated and sourcing and working with MSC. So really great partnership globally. Bringing it a little closer to home though, looking in the United States, which is where I work, I work out of the Seattle office, those are our two offices, Seattle and DC. I work mostly on West Coast things, but these are all the species that are certified within our program. Um, so you can see we have a lot of coverage and um, pretty good assurance that fish caught within the United States has a good chance of being MSC certified because we have really strong management systems in place. Um, but in total, out of all of the volume of fish caught in the United States, MSC covers 85%. So 85% of all fish is actually certified against the MSC standard in the US. So if you ever are curious and want to consider your own shopping preferences, and you want to know if a fish stock is considered certified, we have a website called Track a Fishery um, that allows you to, in the search bar, look by region or by species to see if any of that species is considered certified under the MSC standard. So another thing I want to um, highlight on is how the Marine Stewardship Council gives back. So we're one of the few certifying uh, programs that actually has a, a large grant funding program. So over 5% of the royalties that we get from eco-label sales um, are set aside for this ocean stewardship fund. So that on top of our philanthropic donations, um, we aim to try to, we're aiming to uh, fundraise $10 million to give back to fisheries. And how this supports fisheries is really through all stages of their process. So 
even fisheries that aren't certified that really want to be, but they have major data gaps or they um, need to do more research, we have research grant funds that support that. Or for fisheries that have been certified a really long time and that they want to maintain their certification, we also have funds to support them to stay in the program. This is a, just a summary of how much money we've given back um, to the fisheries communities through um, the years. Okay, so I wanna dive into the fishery standards. So this is my world. I work on the fishery side of things. So basically, the fish before it hits the dock. And so I work with a lot of um, producers, we call them, or fisher people, but mostly fisher people organizations um, that operate up and down the West Coast. So I realize I've been using a term throughout this talk um, that is probably unclear, but what is a fishery? So um, a fishery is defined in, in our vocabulary as a unit or a group of um, people operating within a certain area. So you can define that as uh, maybe the gear type they're using or where they're operating, if they're operating in a, a certain geographic space in the ocean, or what kind of um, boats they're using, or what kind of species that they're specifically targeting. So I took a few pictures from uh, local fisheries we have. So um, the top left-hand corner is the Alaska salmon fishery that is certified in the MSC program. That's a fifth generation fisherwoman in that photo. In the center picture on the top, that is the West Coast ground fish trawl fishery. So that name is kind of defined by the species they're targeting, ground fish, and trawl being the gear type that they're using to catch that fish. The right hand top corner is the Pollock fishery in Alaska. Um, and then the, last, the two on the left bottom are both ground fish fisheries. Um, and then the far right is our Hawaiian fishery targeting big eye. So that is big eye in um, frozen, and that fishery uses long lines to catch big eye. So one of the things that we look at um, within our fishery standard is, even though there are many different types of gear that are used to catch species, at MSC we look at all different impacts on the fishery. So it doesn't matter gear type, it doesn't matter who's fishing. We wanna look at the entire mortality that's happening of harvest happening to that species to really evaluate if the stock is healthy. So um, in this diagram, you have the blue um, ships that are MSC certified. Those are the ones seeking certification or purchasing the, the certification. And then the orange vessels might be, you know, other fishers that are happening, but they're not part of the certification. Um, program. Uh, this is really the nitty gritty. If you want to, you know, talking about science base, these are all the different pieces that we look at when we think about sustainability for a fishery. So you see the three principles I mentioned earlier sustainability of fish stock. These are the different um, scoring guideposts that they are measured against. Principle two looks at minimizing environmental impact and the many other subcategories of things that they're measured against. And principle three, um, the fishery management, the governance and policy of the fishery. And this is just another view to look at, you know, how different gear types or things might impact the environment or other unintended species like marine mammals or endangered and threatened or protected species or seabirds. This is the scoring process that we use to be able to, uh, that, that the fisheries are scored against. So they have to receive an 80 or higher to pass. If they receive a 60, um, they pass with a condition. So a condition is really a roadmap map to say, hey, you didn't quite meet the scoring guidepost. You really could do some more work but this is the roadmap for how you can do better, how you can be more sustainable. And so our fisheries, when they get certified, sometimes they have a roadmap laid out for them for how to do better within their certificate. So, you know, the real takeaway with this certification scheme is this is not a one and done sticker on the fishery. They are working hard throughout the length of their certificate to be best in class when it comes to um, being the, uh, using best management practices to be sustainable. So they are also committing when they're certified to be audited annually. 
um, as well as committing to constantly doing better. So another thing about the MSC standard is we evaluate our standard um, internally as well, and we change our standard every five years to be more rigorous. So when you think about the lifetime of MSC, these fisheries are committing to a process to constantly do better throughout their life cycle of their certificate. So um, let's do a little case study about something closer to home, like how this applies to kind of what's happening here on the West Coast. So do any of you guys know what ground fish is? I think I've said it a few times, but is that just going over your head? Have any of you guys eaten ground fish? Raise your hand if you think you've maybe eaten a ground fish. Okay, few people <laughs> have. So ground fish is just a, an overarching term for a variety of species of fish that live at the bottom of the ocean. So there's uh, many different species in this category. There's lots of categories of rock fish, of ling cod, or different types of cod, or dover or soles, which are flat fish. That, um, I put a little diagram on the bottom to, to trigger your memory. Um, but in the 1990s, here on the West Coast, we had a major event where this groundfish fishery complex collapsed. Um, the fishery was declared a disaster in 2000 by NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, and they shut down the fishery. Um, this collapse was due to a variety of factors, but um, part of it was there was a poor understanding about groundfish biology, um, some species of ground fish, like rockfish, are really long-lived. They live 50-plus years. Um, and there is also a combination of unfavorable environmental conditions that just really um, made the fishery hit rock bottom. And having this fishery shut down was um, really tough on the communities up and down the West Coast. So they couldn't go out and fish. A lot of processors were shut. A lot of people lost their jobs and their livelihoods. Um, and so groundfish fishermen, instead of, uh, I guess, trying to turn their back on the fishery, were really dedicated to supporting the fishery to recover. And so through careful management and better data collection, the West Coast fishery actually rebounded. So this is a really strong example that even if a fishery collapses, there are ways to um, support a fishery to, to recover. Um, so 14 years after the collapse, uh, this groundfish fishery actually received MSC certification. So one of the things that we can kind of support and also recognize and reward all of the, uh, the sustainable practices and all the hard work that these fishermen are doing through the program. So I wanted to um, just watch a little YouTube video about um, this groundfish fishery and highlight one of the families that is, operates in this space. So I'm going to toggle here to YouTube, and let's hope the sound goes. I'm worried that the sound is like playing through here. Yeah, I don't know. I've been fishing since 1980 and then got my sons involved in it. I watched my dad for years. He amazes me at some of the stuff that he knows and can do. It's like, I want to be like you. In 1989 was my first experience of ground fishing. The whole structure was different back then. You could tell that the limits were going to start going down on certain species. Was rockfish on the downhill? Uh, yes, it was. It was. And uh, as it came back, heck yeah. The management program that we have now has been good because we're getting somewhere. We are moving forward. The industry is moving forward. Our fish is recovering. We're seeing it. We're showing it. It's a beautiful thing. My hope for the future is that we can continue ground fishing and harvesting the fish at a conservative level. You can't have such a love and a passion for something and just deplete it. We don't want to see the ocean empty. We respect our oceans and we want a future.
this a month, if not more, just Ooh. from this app on my phone. And I don't know if you can see this, but it's called Audible. Okay, so I'm gonna show you. We don't need to listen to ads. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're, we're, um, we're closing out here. We're getting close, so um, bear with me. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about consumer insights. So the other thing, you know, the other half of MSC, so I work on fisheries, but we also have a whole marketing and communications arm of our business. And really the goal of that arm is to educate consumers about sustainable seafood and also to get a heartbeat on trends on what are people choosing, right? Like are um, people choosing to eat more um, consciously? Uh, what, where are the trends when it comes to that? And so um, every two years, the Marine Stewardship Council partners with a third-party survey organization called GlobeScan. And what we do is um, survey around the world to kind of get just a temperature check on, like, what are um, consumers doing? Are we seeing any behavior change? So um, some of our found findings were that we are seeing Americans are increasingly worried about the ocean and overfishing is a top concern. So overfishing is the second most concerning ocean issue for seafood consumers behind the pollution in the ocean. We also found that support for sustainable seafood is growing. So 62% of uh, respondents said that their seafood choices can actually make a difference to the health of the ocean, and that's up from 58% in 2020. And 62% um, also say that they should rely on consuming fish only from sustainable sources. With 31% of people who say that they have changed their diet to have less of an impact on the environment. Uh, eco labels are also raising consumer trust in the brands that carry them. So there, you know, the Marine Stewardship Council is not the only um, game in town. There are other certification schemes that aim to achieve similar missions. Um, but what we are seeing is that with the Marine Stewardship Council, we have a high level trust in our label. This is um, highlighted not just in the U.S. but also in Canada. We also see that consumers are following retail, U.S. retail chains that are more likely than, um, than the average consumer to be motivated to purchase a product. So the average seafood shopper you know, might, is 47% um, likely to purchase product, but all these other um, loyal shoppers to these different um, retail outlets with, I think, Amazon and Target being some of the highest retails of shoppers who are more likely to buy sustainable seafood. So again, you know, MSC's, one of our main goals is to help consumers shop their values. So 62% of consumers are saying they want to hear more about what companies are doing to um, be more sustainable. So what we're seeing um, across the board with retailers where it comes to like Kroger or Walmart even, um, they are, these retailers are making active commitments to sourcing sustainably, and MSC is one of the ways that we can help them meet those um, sustainability commitments. And that's all I have for you today. So we have, I think, 20 or so minutes for questions. Does anyone have anything that, that I, they want me to toggle back to or explain in more detail? First, let's give Aaron a big thank you and round of applause. Um, I was just checking to see if there was another microphone because I know it's helpful to repeat, have students at least repeat questions over a microphone. So if you're feeling like you want to get some steps in and you also have a question and you'd like to come over to the podium and ask the question into the mic, that would be awesome. Um, if you don't, that's totally fine, and we can repeat the question so that folks who are listening to the recording can hear the question as well. So we're open for questions right now. And as an introvert, I would like hate wanting to walk. Down. There's no way I would walk down to the stage and ask a question. So happy to take anything from your seats. Yeah, feel free to raise your hand as well.
That's a great question. So the question is, um, does MSC certify shellfish? So that's a, yeah, that's a really interesting question, and we do. So we have an aquaculture arm of um, that focuses on anything truly aquaculture. But at the MSC, and it didn't, I didn't know this until I started, we have something called enhanced fisheries. So they're wild shellfish, but they are enhanced in some way that like they are protected or given substrate to grow on, but it is seeded by the wild um, stock. And so those actually are certified um, under the MSC standard. So an example of that is scallops. So scallops in Japan, um, they're given a substrate to grow on, so wild larval scallops can um, either attach on that. Wait, I'm getting scallops and mussels mixed up. I think it's mussels. Um, and so it's given a place to grow, and then they are then harvested, but it's considered a wild fishery because you're not adding um, you know, any lab-produced like uh, seed from, you know, uh, domestic stock to be grown there. We also have wild-caught scallops, which, you know, an area of the ocean is, you know, somewhat protected, and then it is dredged when they're finally ready to be harvested and um, put into the market. So that's another way that we certify shellfish. Yeah. So the question was, for folks listening in on the recording, for the conditional certification, if they don't meet the certification standards at a certain point, um, will that conditional approval be removed? Yes. So the answer is yes. So let's say there is a fishery um, that needs to do a biological stock assessment. When they get certified, they say, hey, you can come into the program, you just pass, but you really need more detail, you need more data. So they're given the five-year certificate to complete that condition. And if they don't complete it within five years, they fall out of the program. So it does kind of like put a fire under some partners to really get some gaps finished or like work with outside researchers to, to fund those, um, that, those research gaps. Okay, we'll go one, two, three. So the question was, if they fall out of the certification, will they reapply, or do they just get the one chance? They're always welcome to reapply, but you know our grading rubric remains the same. We don't play favorites, so it's really up to them if they can make it, if they want to spend the money and, and fall flat on their face again. Um, but the one thing that we is really unique about our market-driven approach is that there is a benefit, a market benefit for these fisheries to get certified. So they can say, wow, certification gets top dollar in price per pound. It's incentive enough for them to say, you know, let's do our best, put energy into filling these gaps or in closing out these conditions to get certified again. There was another question over here. That's a great question. So does the certification cover handlers and also transporters or kind of other level of folks up the supply chain? And then how would you go about sourcing uh, responsible seafood that's raw or yeah. that's um, able to be consumed raw? That's great. And yes, so this supply chain um, traceability that we have is basically whatever section along the line that the company takes ownership of the fish. So right. Let's an example. I have a, um, let's say, a squid fishery that's operating in California. When the squid hits the dock, they sell to a processor. That processor then goes and fillets it into calamari rings or however it's cut. And then it's sold to another company, which packages it in, or breads and fries it and packages it into a frozen form. And then it's sold at the end of the day to... Um, to like Whole Foods, for example. And so each part of that supply chain, whoever touches the fish has to have chain of custody certification, has to have paperwork around that. Um, and so when it goes to how to um, 
how do you make choices about buying fresh fish? Um, some of our best partners actually are that have chain of custody certification at the point of sale, so at the point of when a consumer is buying it at the, the fish, uh, fresh fish, I guess, table or something. Costco is a great source. They're a fantastic partner. Um, Walmart also has chain of custody certification and also Amazon or Whole Foods. So those are, I guess, my personal go-tos is those retailers for fresh fish. We had another question over here. That's a great question. So the question was, are the consumer insights global? And if not, do you have any global insights you could share? Yeah, so in this survey that we did, we looked um, primarily at the North American market, so US and Canada, but we did sample lightly other global um, countries. The, so the insights I shared with you are really for American consumers. The market is really different globally. Like if we were sitting in Germany, we would be having a very different conversation about seafood consumption. And one of the things that at least I've learned in this role is that Americans are kind of behind when it comes to consuming seafood. We don't consume that much seafood compared to Europe, for example. So Europe has a completely different market, clientele, people are consuming seafood in different ways. And actually, the Marine Stewardship Council was started in London. We have a much stronger presence in Europe than we do in the US. So the US is kind of an emerging market. We're still educating people in this country about um, sustainable seafood. Um, jumping in off that question, I, I have a question that I'd love, <laughs> yeah. love uh, to hear your perspective on. Um, you showed us a great map of countries that um, rely on seafood for livelihoods and also for food security. Um, 85% of the U.S. market is certified. What are some emerging markets where seafood consumption is really high that MSC is focusing on for certification? Are there any that you're aware of? Like the producers are being certified or like giving consumers an option? The producers are being certified. Well, um, there is a term called a fishery in progress or a FIP. So another nonprofit, if you want to flag in your browser to look into is fisheryprogress.org. They work in the emerging space. So fisheries that are small or still struggling with data um, to get them along the line of to sustainability. They still use the Marine Stewardship Council as like the grading rubric, but they really work in the like small scale emerging space. And those fisheries, you know, we see them all over the world. We have Indonesian fisheries, we have um, Ecuadorian fi fisheries that are um, still working on their way towards being more sustainable. So I guess there's not one region, but um, really trying to empower those spaces in the world to like get the data that they need so that they can, you know, use best practices in their fishing. Excellent, thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. So the question was um, about the Innovation Fund and if there are any examples. Yeah, I mean, this space is uh, just growing so fast. I think I'm a, I'm a technology nerd and I am amazed by how much we can really shape an industry um, just by new options. So um, one example is electronic monitoring. So it's really hard to get a person out on a boat to observe what's happening, right? To have full, you know, transparency, someone on deck being like, oh, are they catching a sea turtle or are they, you know, not? And so electronic monitoring, having cameras based on ships um, is a really cool way now of like being able to get some third party observation of what's happening in a fishery. Um, another cool thing that's just, as we're learning more about interactions of uh, the fishing industry with like endangered species, um, some fishing, uh, uh, efforts are using new things like lights on trawl lines. So for example, the, um, off the west coast here in Oregon, California, there's a pink shrimp fishery. And they, are, they use pelagic trawl nets. So that means that they run a trawl line in the middle of the water column to catch shrimp. And, uh, but one of the uh, endangered species that they interact with 
and they've had a hard time not interacting with is called Eulicon, or it's called Candlefish. It's a small little bait fish, but it's um, ESA listed. But what they found is if they put LED lights on the bottom of their trawl net as they're pulling it through the water, the shrimp don't see the lights, so the shrimp still get caught in the net. But the eulicon or candlefish see the lights and they actually divert away. So we actually have videos of um, you know, the trawl moving through the water column and avoiding the catch of that endangered species, but catching the intended targeted species, which is shrimp. So I'm just, yeah, I think those innovations are happening all the time. It's just kind of cool to see how they're being used. Okay, these are great questions. I think we have time for one more. Last question. Yeah, there's, um, you know, some of the biggest challenges I think are either data gaps, you know, like for example, in the United States, uh, these fisheries are heavily reliant on like federal or state resources like the Department of Fish and Wildlife or um, NOAA to either fund research cruises to get biological stock assessments or, or whatever. And those state and federal agencies are really funding crunched. So sometimes these fisheries aren't getting certified just because, oh, the state of Oregon hasn't run their survey, so we can't do it. Um, the other thing is when you look at international fisheries like tuna. So tuna is a high seas fishery. So if you ever take, I don't even know if they still teach it here, but the law of the sea, which is at the law school, they talk about um, different jurisdictions and waterways. So state waters, federal waters, high seas. And so tuna fisheries are uh, managed on the high seas level. So many different countries, like in Pacific tuna might be, you have Australia at the table, Japan, China, US, um, other South American countries that all decide on how much they will choose to catch. And it's a consensus decision. And so if one country says, hey, I don't agree to that catch limit, I want more, um, they're at an impasse and they can't pass a harvest management rule. And so if they don't have those management strategies in place, they fail out of our program. So that's another thing. It's not necessarily the fishery's fault. It's like the management isn't able to come to an agreement on harvest control rules. Okay, excellent. Let's give Erin another round of applause. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you.